We are on week three of this message series, and I pray that you receive a bunch out of it already, but today we're going to dive in today, and we're going to get serious about parenting. Maybe you haven't had kids yet, but one day you will, and you'll understand what God's Word uh, desires for us to be parents and how we should raise our children. So we're on week three of Home and Heart, and my sincere desire for you guys is whether you're a current parent or maybe uh, a prospective one, and learning how to be a positive influence in your child's life rather than a negative one. We understand that there's people in this church that had negative lifestyles as children. And I ask you to open your heart in really seeking, having seeking minds to explore this topic that resonates deeply within the hearts of every family. And I titled this message with a question. Should we discipline our children? Uh Uh-oh. All the kids are like, "Uh uh-oh. It's a big question that our families have. Should we discipline our children? As parents, as guardians, as caregivers, you know, we bear the profound responsibility of nurturing and guiding the next generation to be followers of Jesus Christ. But in this modern world where the landscape of parenting advice is vast, it often contradicts information that's going on. We find ourselves asking, should we discipline our children? And if so, how do we do that? Everybody has their own own idea as a parent on how to discipline your child. But God is very clear on how to discipline your children. And today I want to delve into the important aspect of our roles as caregivers and parents, seeking wisdom from Scripture. Because that's important. Understanding from our experience that for me preaching this, I personally been married 30 years. I've, I have two boys 30 years old and actually 17. So we've, Don and I have been parents in all generations. And so I want to give you a, some experience, wisdom of some failures and also some successes on how we discipline our children. We'll get this from scripture, from a little bit of experience from your pastor on this approach of really the discipline of our children and how important that is in their life as believers. And you know, from the very heart of our faith of of Jesus Christ and in this church, I want us to approach this subject with some empathy, with some grace, because I know parenting is hard and discipline your child Man, it's scary, isn't it? And I want you to walk in with empathy and grace and a desire to cultivate not only obedience, but also a lasting foundation of love and respect and spiritual growth in our children's lives. So let us go on this journey together, church, knowing that our pursuit of understanding will ultimately lead us to a place of deeper connection with our children and a stronger, more vibrant community of faith of believers in this church that the next generation will take over from us, succeeding more than we ever done in our walk with Jesus because of the way we not just raise them up, but also discipline our children. So let me pray for you because I know as I dive into this message series and this message today that the enemy is going to come in and try to taint and try to mess up what I'm saying to you. And I want you to receive this with open hearts and ears that are open to hear the word of God today, amen? So let me pray for you. Father, Lord, we just thank you that this word that you've given me will speak words of wisdom and understanding to the hearts of each and every parent and prospective parents. Father, we know that there's caregivers in this church that are caring for their grandkids. And Lord, that that is hard in this world today, that everything's against the next generation. 
But Father, that you're going to teach us on the, the ways of discipline that will empower our children, not hurt them. We give you praise for that. In Jesus' mighty name, and everybody said, amen. So as we dive into today, there's all forms of discipline should be directed to our children's actions, not their soul. Let me say that again. So many people discipline their children and break their souls in the midst of it. I see it over and over and over that we encounter numerous individuals whose souls who have been wounded by their earlier childhood experiences. And the actions taken against them and words that were spoken to them destroyed their soul. We think that discipline is to correct the child, but that's not true. Discipline is to correct the action that the child did, not the child himself or herself. It's the action that we correct, not the soul. And I see so many broken souls because of the way we were raised. It could have been not just your parents. It could have been a teacher, a, a, a coach. All those things they think, if we could just disciple or discipline this child enough that they'll listen and really we're just breaking their souls. And my heart breaks because we have a group called Freedom that we do twice a year. We're in like week eight in our Freedom groups on Sunday nights. And freedom is helping people with this. Souls that are broken because of the way they were disciplined. And so as I was diving into this message and I was seeking God on this message, he's given me some, some profound topics that I can really share with you that's going to help you not break your child's soul, but help direct the action they're going. Does that make sense? So here's a question for us today. So how do we discipline our child without shattering their soul? It makes me, it makes me weep because I see men, grown men, whose souls are, are, are just so hurt by their childhood. I see women who, who live this life of always trying to please everybody because of the way they were raised as, as kids. The Bible is very clear on discipling our children. And I want to give us scripture first because I want us to understand that God wants you to discipline your children. He wants us to discipline them. It's important that we discipline them. Listen, to I have, I have a couple of scriptures that they all in Proverbs chapter 29, verse 15, start there. The rod and rebuke gives wisdom. Come on now. But a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. If you keep closing your eyes on your children's actions, they're going to bring a mother's heart to a place where she's going to be weeping and crying every night. He says, don't spare the rod. And rebuke gives wisdom. It doesn't hurt the child. I will say this in the midst of that. No, I'm going to dive into that in a little bit because I, I want us, I, I'm, it's going to be in my points. Here's, here's verse 17, chapter 29, verse 17. Discipline your child. And they will give you peace of mind and will make your hearts glad. Come on, parents. Don't we want some glad hearts? Then discipline your children. Come on now, I'm going to get in your grill today. How about this, verse 18? Where there's no revelation, people cast off restraint, but happy is he who keeps the law. Dads, you're the law, giver. You're the law guy, I'm telling you. Don't always, I felt like don't always made me the enemy. Wait till your daddy gets home and said, why can't you just do it? Why I got to be the bad person, Don? How about you be the bad person, right? Come on, you ever had arguments as parents? Stop making me the bad guy. Good cop, bad cop, right? It seemed like I always got the bad cop moment. Wait till your daddy gets home. And then she calls me and said, hey, they doing this. Wait till you get home, I told them. I'm like, no, how about you just go ahead and you give them the rod instead of me. I'll love on them right? Let me be the good guy for once. But where there's no revelation, where there's no vision, it says, and we'll dive into that. But here's what I really want you to receive today, that children are people too. They're people with feelings. They have souls. 
God created them. He loves them. He wants to see the best for them. In the midst of their growing up, in their adolescent years, in their trying to understand this world, parents, you are the guiding light to your children. You're going to create the pathway for your children to know what's right and wrong in the Word of God and in this world. Because Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, so God created human beings in His own image. That's even your children. And you're probably like, I'm questioning that right now. We've seen your children. I'm just messing. That was supposed to be a joke. And in the image of God, He created them. Male and female, He created them. So why is it that children's lives are being broken, their souls are being broken by parents? It's because I don't think we understand the difference between action and the child itself. I think we see the child do something and we go after the child, not at at the action of the child, and try to help the child understand the difference of what is right and what is wrong. Of course, there's going to be consequences in the midst of it. And so I want us to start with the negative side of parenting. And that's the actions we take that shatter the child's spirit. I'm going to give you some areas that I really believe these are the factors that will cause your child as they get older to be in our freedom groups. Me and Dawn always prayed, Lord, don't let us raise damaged adults. Teach us, God. It would be our prayer all the time. That when my boys grow up, I don't want them to have to start in the freedom group to try to get set free from the damage that me and Dawn caused. Not saying they won't go through trouble, not saying they won't make their own actions as they get older, but I'm talking about they, it won't be the reason because of Dawn and I. And so we fought for ourselves. We prayed that through. We seek God on this. And I want you to understand some of the actions that we take as parents, as guardians, as grandparents right? That, that shattered the child's spirit. And here they are. Here's the first one. If you're taking notes, refusing to listen. That's such a big one. That a kid has no voice. That we don't stop and listen to our child. When they're doing something, you ask them the question, what are you doing and why are you doing this? If they go to speak, you just over, you just come over them and you don't let them talk. You ask them a question, not letting them speak then you're just shutting the child down. And what that gives a message to the child is that you don't count. That you have no voice in this house. And if you're speaking, hey, this is my house, you don't like it, you can always leave. Don't ever speak that over your children. Give your children an opportunity to have a voice. Here's another one that will actually shatter the child's spirit is that we... This one without explanation. You know, we must avoid, actually, to a point of spanking. <laughs> I know some of you would be like, you, you, spanking? Yeah, the, the Bible says don't spare a rod. Right? But we discipline without explanation. And so, so many times, parents are consumed by anger. When the child is acting up, that as we spank the child that they don't know why they're being spanked. You assume they know that what they did was wrong, but they really, that at the time, they don't. They're not, their minds don't work that way. And you come in and just rush them with spanking, what will happen is that child will shut down and think that they're bad, and my dad or my mom don't like me or love me. I know this goes against the grain for some of you, that the way you were raised is the way it was, and I turned out okay. Did you? Our, ch- our children will be left very puzzled by the action. Why we may believe that they should be aware of it, they're really not. You know, we need to allow certain behaviors. We can't allow certain behaviors to persist unchecked, though. What happens is, is that mom and dad, you come home from work, you're tired, the children are acting up, they've been acting up, they've been doing the same thing that you unchecked, that it didn't bother you yesterday, but today your boss got on your nerves, the coworker you want to take out, and you're like, you come home, and a child does the same thing it's been doing 
or he or she has been doing for the last two months that you didn't say anything about, and all of a sudden, you go on a rampage of spanking. That is very confusing to a child. And I will say this, when you spank your children, don't do it with a, with a hand. Do it with an item. You're like, what is this guy preaching? <sighs> Let me explain. When you spank someone or smack them in the face with a hand, they fear you. But if you pull the spoon out, like Ms. Dawn used to do, they fear the spoon, not mama. Does that make sense? The Bible didn't say you hit him with your hand. It said don't spare the rod. Because now the rod is the problem, not mama or daddy. But if you go beating your child with your hand, guess what? That physical contact will put a, put a soul breaking in their spirit that they will be afraid of you. They won't come to you. They won't tell you anything. So when you don't spare the rod, like Dawn used to, like, man, my, my youngest one, he, he, that spoon had, a, had his name on it, right? Dawn would have to keep it in a purse. Because he liked to hide in a, any, any hider, children hide in a, in a grocery store or the Walmart. You can't find them, right? And they think it's funny. And they run from you and they don't stop or they're they doing cart, cartwheels down the thing and they won't stop acting up. And they, you're just like, man, stop it, right? All it took was one time. Dawn got that spoon, whack! And he was like, whoa, that hurt. The next time we go to Walmart, she pulls that spoon out, and, and Ethan, my youngest one, would be like, he wasn't afraid of mama. He was afraid of that spoon. Because we understood that when you hit your child with your hand, or you, let's say, spank your child with your hand in good intentions, that that's a connection between you and them. Does that make sense? But don't refuse to not spank your children. The Bible is very clear why you should. You should spank for the action, but don't break their soul. Don't do it in anger. Because if you have this anger moment and you start to spank your children, it can really categorize as misplaced frustration in your hearts and theirs. Because whatever you got to understand, whatever you allow, you created that. And if your children are being allowed to do certain things for a long period of time, and then all of a sudden it bothers you now, you can't just go think your children are going to listen because they thought it was good. They thought it was okay to scream at each other because you didn't say anything. Go in your room, close the door, stop screaming, but you don't have any 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 rebuttal against it, you just kind of ignore it, and guess what will happen? You will come in, and you will start a process of your kids not knowing what they've done. You have to add boundaries. So maybe you're a parent who has no boundaries, and whatever you have in front of you, your children's acting up, and they don't listen, and daddy, you got to come home all the time because they disrespect and mom, is that is what you allowed, and you created that. But there is a way out of that. You start setting small boundaries that your children can walk to over, and each day they start to understand that there's a new sheriff in town. And it ain't them. Come on now. So, but we have to, we have to walk in wisdom here. So we have, to, we have to explain to them. Go into, hey, I'm going to spank you, and let me tell you why. I know that's hard. Man, my dad never did that. I just knew I was getting something. When he came home and mama said, wait for daddy to get home, I dreaded it. And I feared my dad. And a lot of times I didn't know what I did. It wasn't their fault. It was just, it was just the way parenting was. But as you dive into learning something, hey, guess what? You can create this. Here's another one, and I'll help you understand this in a little bit. Okay? Here's, here, here's another one that can shatter your child's spirit, ignoring their opinions and requests. I said it this earlier, children are people, and we actually tend to belittle our ch children, and what they don't know, 
or when they don't know is because they're six years old, yo. They're six. They don't understand the wisdom of life and understand what mom and daddy knows. They, they, you, you can't assume they're watching every step you make in your household and expect them to just be obedient to your culture of your house if they don't understand what's going on. They're six. And we belittle our children because they're six and they don't know what they're doing. And you're like, what do you don't know what you're doing? No. It's amazing when you can allow your child to have their own thoughts, but lead them to the right answers. It's amazing when you give your child this ownership of their own home, that this is their house too, that they belong to a family called the Roussels or whatever your last name is. This is, this is your house. We take ownership of our house. This is what it looks like. And when you act this way, what you're doing is you're creating a mess up in the culture of this home. And here's the culture, and this is why we do these things. When you start to talk to your children like that, guys, I'm telling you, we pounded this in our children's face. Why? Because we wanted them to understand that this is their house too. Now, they just don't leave and they eat all our food still. And I keep telling them, like, hey, you're old now, go. Oh, Jesus, please. You said it's mine. Yeah, until a certain age, then you got to go. Stop eating my food. But you know what? We created that. Why? Because I always wanted my boys to know that they have, that their house is theirs too. And they have a play and a moment to play in it. There's a season that when you give your child ownership, that they actually have, hey, can we do this in the house? Can, can our culture look like this? They can have requests and you have conversations. You know what happens is that your child starts to honor and respect you a little bit more than, than normal. They start to look at you as mom and dad, the spiritual leaders of the household. Not the, not the rule-oriented dictators with the hatred of the... <clears throat> You act up, I'm coming. Come on now, anybody able to raise in a house like that? And then you don't want your children to be raised like that, so you go to the extreme of doing nothing? And now your kids are out of control? Guess what? There has to be a balance in there, amen? So ignoring their opinions and requests over and over and over will create this, this model of a child's spirit being broken. How about this, making demeaning comparisons. Please don't do this, church. I know this message, I'm, 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 I'm hammering some of you. Please don't compare your children to another child. I wish you were like Pastor Brian's kids. No, you don't. You compare them to the siblings. I wish you'd act just like your brother. See, if you're just like your sister, they're not. They're not like their sister. They're not like their brother. Never tell your child, I wish you were like your neighbor's kids. I wish you were smart like them. I wish you would play football like them. I wish you would be like this. I wish. Please, you are destroying your child's spirit when you act that way. Maybe you were raised like that. Criticism actually helps. No, it does not. Constructive criticism, but not criticism. I was raised with family members, aunts and uncles and all. They just felt like they needed to talk down to you thinking they're going to grow you. Come on now. That wasn't true. When you make demeaning comparisons, comparing your child negatively to a sibling or peers can harm their self-esteem, guys. If you were like... And consistently be belittling your children, you what happens is the child's effort or achievements can lower their self-worth of who they are and what they believe. And then they start to look at the Father God the same way they're being treated by you. And what you're doing is we're moving our children further and further away from the one who can save them because we feel like, hey, we need to let them know that we got to give them somebody to compare to. 
I, I have a scripture for this. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. It says this, come on. And look, if you're a parent, and I'm challenging you right now, don't get your feelings hurt. You're getting your feelings hurt because you wasn't disciplined the right way when you were a child. Can I, can I set you free today? Just hear the word of God and say, okay, we're just going to make adjustments. Can you just do that today? This is not me going, hey, you're, you're a bad parent. This is just saying things I wish everybody knew when they started parenting. Right? This is what we probably wish our parents did. We'd probably be better off, wouldn't we? So when you hear this, don't take it as an insult. Take it as a, a growth moment. I'm challenging your actions, not your soul. I'm pulling a spoon out. I should have brought one. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. How about this? Come on. If you're a guardian or a parent, don't be selfish. Man, don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others as better than yourself. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. Take your interest in your children too. Don't compare others. Don't compare your children to others. Don't look out for your own interests because a lot of times we go out and we want our children to compare them so we can look good to other parents because your children's acting crazy. It's okay that they flip around over and over in class and the teacher has to call you every day. They're just active. Manage that. Consult that. Lead them to the right pathway. But don't ever compare them to other people. But take, come on, listen to the scripture, but take an interest in others too. Take an interest in who your child is. As parents, we've got to look at the bright side of our children. Right? That they don't look like you, they look like your mom. Thank you, Jesus. But take interest in others too, that you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. I'm telling you, when you take the approach of a, of a parent who is not at, trying to be selfish in their own life and putting their past hurts in their life onto their children, but they look at their children for who they are and what God created them in their own interest, it says that we will look and have the attitude as Jesus had. Here's the next one. Here's the last one that can break your child's spirit. And this is a big one, using fearful words. There was an author named Peggy Omariah. She said this, the way we talk to our children becomes their inner voice. Some of us are sitting in these seats now that battle with that inner voice in their ear. You're not worthy. You're not good enough. God don't love you. You're never going to make it. That's what you do for a living? Oh, you're stupid. You're not good enough. As parents, that little inner voice says, hey, you're never going to parent well. You're not good enough. Look at your children. They're bad. They're not good. Look at their grades. They just must be stupid. They're taken after you. I'm telling you, the enemy has been speaking in your ear since you were a child. And it came from the people that we love the most. Shut that inner voice off and start filling it with the word of God, who he says you are and what your children are. And when you start to take ownership of your house spiritually, you start to say, enemy, you have no more power in this home that my Lord and Jesus is the ruler of this house. Your house culture will change like this. You will set up boundaries for your children. You will take those broken spirits that maybe you caused in the beginning of the years or later, you, you will start to mend those. Because criticizing their best efforts is not the way. Have you grown up feeling unable to satisfy your parents? Have you had to try to prove yourself over and over and over and you still don't get a good job? And you go in there and you tell your mom and dad, hey, this is what I do for a living now. And you're like, oh, that's it? What is the benefits there? Oh, they don't have health insurance? Well, that's just a dumb job. Have you ever finished a job? Have you ever done this? Have you ever done that? And they criticize you over and over and you can't please them. So you go off on another path and you try to please them. You change college, uh, uh, where you're going to college for one thing and you got to change it because you want your parents to be happy with what you're doing and you can't stand it. it comes from this. Can I tell you, God's given you an identity. He created you. 
Your parents might have been a vessel for God to use to get you on this planet. But God has a purpose for you, and you don't have to prove nothing to anyone. And this pursuit of approval extends throughout your entire life if you don't deal with it. It will impact your ability to hold a job. As you struggle to gain your boss's favor, you will quit jobs over and over because you can't get the affirmation that you're looking for for your whole life from your parents. You start to apply this to everything in your life. And when you get married, it gets worse. When your spouse and you're married 30 years and you, you see each other and you still look for approval, and you're like, why you, why you don't tell me I'm, I'm awesome and this and that? Like, do you still need this? After 30 years, after 20 years, after 5 years, after 10 years, oh my God, why do I keep, have to fill your voids when you need Jesus to fill your voids? Come on now. Look, it goes into the marriage, y'all. We should empower each other. We should encourage each other. We should rebuke each other. The Bible is very clear about relationships. But at the end of the day, when we are sitting there trying to get affirmation from everybody, then we will walk this life never succeeding in anything. You will hunt money, you will hunt fame, you will hunt girls, and you will hunt glory. And you know what you're going to come up? Empty. Every time. Because when you get it all and you still don't have that void filled, you probably want to look at the fearful words that were spoken into your life of your enemy. Be cautious of what you speak to your children. Even in your frustration moment that you got to pull the spoon out. You say, hey, you know what? I love you, but what you've done, you're in trouble for it. Let me tell you what you've done wrong. Didn't we have a conversation about this 14 times? Yeah. You're still getting a spanking. And some of your children feel pain differently. Some, they like the spoon. It's okay, they get to go by and do what they want to do again. Some, you got to take everything out their room, and now they're tormented. Some, if you pull the spoon out, they're just going to shut down and never touch it again. But you got to figure that out on your own. So here, approach to the guide of discipline our children. Here, approaches to the guide of discipline of our children. This is some of the things I wrote out. I want you to hear this. Proverbs chapter 29, 17, discipline your child and they'll give you peace of mind and make your heart glad. How many parents in here want to have a peace of mind about their children? Come on, raise your hand. Yeah, yeah. I think all of us, right? We want to make sure they do that. My, my, my boys are growing up. My 17-year-old is driving now. I'm on his own. This week, he drove for the first time to work by himself, and me and his mom were like, Lord Jesus, help us. And of all days, it rained. But he made it back home. And now he's all grown up. He's buying his own food now, right? I told him the other day, I said, hey, pick me up. A, uh, he works at Chick-fil-A. I said, hey, pick me up a chicken sandwich on your way home. He said, well, I'm getting gas. And, you know, they only put like, like 20 bucks in it. Don't fill it up because it's like, that's too much money. And then he, he comes back and he comes home and he goes, now I know that you make that face when you and mom go out to dinner. And I say, hey, can y'all pick me up some Subway on your way back? And you give me this look like, Really? He said, when I paid $6 for that chicken sandwich, I'm like, man, my money felt like it was flying out my pocket. I put $20 in gas, $6 on a chicken sandwich. I started looking at my bank account. It starts going lower and lower and lower. I'm like, he goes, now I know how you feel, Dad. I'm like, about time. About time. About time. Come on, Jesus. But this one, your children will give you peace of mind and a glad heart. I get to see my boys raised up and having their own, own life and experience that level now. We're out of the adolescent years and the younger years, really. But here's the first thing that we got to give our children. Send love towards them. Send your love towards them. Send your love towards them. I get it. Maybe you don't feel loved because of your childhood, but don't put that on your children. You give your children what you never experienced. That's called changing a family tree, amen? You don't go, well, this is the way I was treated. This is the way you're going to be treated. Well, that's just called just pure stupidity. Can I just be real? Don't do that. Say, you know what? I'm going to have a better life. I'm going to send love towards them. There's no substitute for loving our children. Regardless of how bad they're acting up, 
You're just going to have to get better and, and pray more. That's all. And create cultures and boundaries. Here's the next one. Here's the next one. Provide good things for them to look forward to. Man, give them some vision. The Bible says this in the King James Version. I said this earlier, but this is the King James Version where there is no vision that people perish. No vision, people perish. If your child doesn't know the vision of the household, that this is who we are, this is what we're going to become, this is what it's going to look like, here's what mom and dad's vision is for this house, here's our vision for you, here's what God says about you. When we don't give that vision, your kids have nothing to look forward to. And when their friends come and tell them bad stuff, they're like, no, you're a liar, because my mom and dad told me who I am and what I'm all about my whole life. You're going to hear next week, we're going to have a panel of some of the young adults that were raised up in Christian homes, how they have to take their Christianity to the world in college and workplace and how that looks. And we get to hear from our younger generation here next week. It's going to be, a, I, I'm excited to, to, for those guys and girls to, to give their thoughts on that. But it's because they were raised up with vision and that the people shouldn't perish because, listen to this, children are great imitators, so give them something to imitate. Give them something great to imitate. Here's the next one. We provide good things for them to look forward to. Carefully explain the reason you're disciplining them. Explain it to them. Hey, you're punished because you spoke against your mom when she corrected you. That was two days ago. I know. I did not forget. Now you're punished. Aw, do it again, and you'll be in there longer. Aw, carefully explain it to them. Explain to them why. You got to give the kids the why behind the what. Is this helping, guys? All right, here's, I got two more, and then we're going to finish up. Carefully explain the reason you dis uh, discipline them. Here's another one. Use a tone of voice that is loving but strong. Because you are angry, you will spank harder, guys. Don't do this in your anger. Do it in your love. If you are balled up because your kids are frustrating you so much, walk away. Come back to it. Hey, guys, we're going to have a talk when I get back. And you walk off and you calm down. You pray, Lord, help me discipline my child the right way that they can feel it. <laughs> Come on. And the Lord will give you wisdom. And when you go back in there, you correct them. And they carefully understand what you're doing, but you're doing it in your loving voice. You don't have to get loud like I do. I figure the louder I talk, the more they'll hear it. And my wife's like, Brian, I'm standing right in front of you. Why are you talking so loud? Well, uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> but it helped me understand over the years, and my wife kept telling me that, that I had to, if I talk with a very, very strong tone of voice, but very, very empowering, my kids will listen better. And they did. But if you do it in anger, what you're doing is you're getting out your problems on your child. And that's not fair for them. Amen? Here's the last one. Keep your promises. Man, I told my, my youngest when at eight years old I was going to take him to shoot guns. I'm a man of my word. I ain't said I'm going to do it right away. But eventually I'm going to get to it. He didn't, he didn't shoot guns until he was 16 years old. Eight years, I heard every year, yeah, you said you are going to take me to shoot guns, Dad. I'm like, well, e, I don't have a gun to shoot. Until I buy one, we'll go shoot them. Right? And he reminded me every day that I told him we would go. And I remember at the shooting range, I had a pistol, and we're shooting, he's shooting. I looked at him, I said, take me off your list, bro. Check it. I did what I said I was going to do. Eight years, I'm like, I still did it. I'm a man of my word. He said, true that. He understood that I did what I said I was going to do. There's something about keeping promises even in discipline. If you do that again, when we get home, you're going to be punished. Come on, how many people use that? We all use that one. And you get home, they're in a good mood, you're in a good mood, and you're like, I ain't dealing with that. No, you keep that promise. 
hey, come see in your room. Yeah, but I thought everything was good. You got me McDonald's french fries. Like, you take them in your room with you. You punish. Keep your promises. You tell your children and you discipline them. Keep your promises. I want to shift gears here. Matthew chapter 5, verse 33. Here's what God says about keeping promises. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, don't break your oath. But fulfill to the Lord the vows that you have made. But I tell you, don't, do not swear an oath to all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is his city of the great king. Do not swear by your own head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. All you need is a simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. You don't promise your children that you can't give. It needs to be yes or no. Will we do that? Yes. When? When I, when I say so. But it will happen. You don't have to sit there and have this degree on an explanation why and how long and all these things. You let your yes be yes and your no be no. That means for all you people pleasers. You give your children whatever they need because they just keep asking you and you don't care anymore because you can't say yes or no. You let your yes be yes and your no be no. And when your children understand this and you're a man of your, and a woman of your word and you make, keep your promises, they know when mom and dad says yes or no that they're serious. It's a great way to start discipling your children inside of their discipline. God loves your children. But here's how I want to close the service out. This ain't about parents. It's about all of us. We are all children. We might be older, but we were children at one time. And can I tell you this? That the Lord calls you his children and that he loves you. And no matter what you went through in your childhood, can I say this to you, that God is in love with you? I'm going to ask everybody to stand. And I know we're running a little long today. But I'm going to ask our pastors to come forward. And if you need to leave, I totally get it. You can. I mean, it, the service is, is concluding. But I wanted to open these altars. Come on, Shane, shall we? Yo, yo, yo. You tell them my prayer team. Come on up. Nicole. As I was preparing this, the Lord told me that there are people in this room that never been loved as children, and you're still looking for love today. And the Lord wanted me to tell you that he loves you. Not for who you are, not what you've done for him, not coming to church today because he knows you by name. And every day he thinks about you. He knows how many hairs are on your head. He understands where you're going and what's coming up. He understands the child life that you had, the abuse, the destruction. Maybe your parents left you. Maybe you were a foster child. Here's what he told me to tell you. You do not need to prove yourself that he loves you. John chapter 1, verse 10 says this. He was in the world, and through the world, he was made through him. Talking about Jesus. The world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Jesus, his own, didn't even receive him. So when you were left astray by your parents and they didn't treat you the way that most kids should be treated and you live this life in torment, can I tell you Jesus knows how you feel? He said, but his own did not receive him yet. 
to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. And so we're going to worship. And for some, you need prayer. Maybe you just need that moment where you just know that God loves you. And you need to come to the altars, have one of our pastors or leaders, church leaders, pray for you. If you want to just come to the altar and seek the Lord during this moment. But let's just take a simmering moment. Let's give God the praise and tell the Lord, thank you for loving me, God. Because I don't feel loved. There's a few of you in here that way. Can I tell you, welcome to God's family. And welcome to this house. Because you're loved here. So as we worship, let's praise God. If you need prayer, come forward. If you have to go, I get it. But come on, let's just take this moment and give it to the Lord. Come on, let's worship. Thank you so much for joining us online. Connect Fellowship Church exists to lead people to change their family tree by becoming a fully engaged follower of Jesus Christ. We would love to know about what God is doing in your life. And you can tell us by going to connectfellowship.church forward slash connection card. You can also connect with us on Instagram, Facebook, or YouTube. For locations and service times, visit connectfellowship.church. We are so excited that you joined us today, and we pray that you have experienced a life change through this message. We hope that you have an amazing day.